Hello everybody, welcome to the lounge, hope you're all doing well, and uh, today I guess it's time for my Ukraine-Russia conflict video, where I do sort of an overview of the conflict, and what I wanted to do is sort of lay out all of the basics of everything that's gone on over the past eight years or so, because the thing I notice amongst my English-speaking friends is that they don't seem to kind of really know the history and the flow of events and discerning the myths and the propaganda from what has actually happened. And they all kind of describe the conflict as complicated, which to a degree it is. Uh, but I figured that as a Russian person, uh, who also has some Ukrainian heritage in them, it was probably good of me to uh, be sort of louder about this issue and cover it a little bit better. And uh, now that I've kind of spent a few months looking at it and refreshing myself on Ukraine and Russia, I feel like I can give a competent summary of everything that's gone on. And uh, obviously my strength is in fundamental analysis, so I'll give you guys some of that. And then at the end of the video, I'll refer you to somebody who can give you uh, kind of week-to-week updates on the war in a far more competent way than I can. So on that note, let's get going. First, very quickly, here is a map of the region. And uh, it's important for the purposes of this discussion to understand that in Ukraine, the West and the East are a bit culturally different. For example, the further east you go, the more Russian speakers and pro-Russia people you will find, also the less wealth you will find, and the further west you go, the more pro-Western Ukrainian speakers you will find, and the more wealth you'll find. So with all that said, let's sum up 2014 to 2021, because that is how we got here. So in 2014, between February and March, Russia invaded and annexed the area in southeastern Ukraine known as Crimea. Now, the reason that they did this is it was triggered by their president, Viktor Yanukovych, being removed from power by his own parliament. Now, uh, Viktor Yanukovych was a pro-Russia president who was openly supported by Putin. To make a very long story short, he was ousted because he abandoned the path of the Ukraine joining the European Union and abandoning that entire process. Now, a lot of people in the Ukrainian regime weren't happy about that because it seemed like it was a bad economic decision to many of them. But that is the reason that he was ousted. In any case, when Vladimir Putin saw the ouster of uh, his kind of main man in the Ukraine, he saw that as a symbol of the Ukraine starting to permanently pull away from Russia and towards the West. And this was something he couldn't accept. And we'll talk about his motivations uh, in a little bit. But at that point, Putin decided that he was going to start to try to take Ukraine by force and uh, first he was going to take Crimea, observe the consequences, and sort of see what he could get away with. So Putin moved in on Crimea using several stages. He attacked with masked and unmarked troops. He uh, took over the Crimean parliament. And then eventually he forced a referendum on the people where the choices on the referendum were to either become independent, which the extremely poor Crimean area would never want to do, or to join Russia. Now, you might notice that in that referendum, the status quo of remaining with the Ukraine was not offered as an option, which just kind of shows you the degree to which the referendum was a sham. But in either case, Putin managed to take over Crimea with very little military resistance and really little resistance of any kind. Back then, the Ukrainian military was extremely weak, and though it has been strengthening since then, uh, there really wasn't much to stop Putin at the time. Now, this mini-invasion wasn't cheap for Putin. There were a bunch of repercussions. Uh, there were sanctions that were levied. Russia was kicked out of the G8, which then became the G7. And uh, there was just general discontent. The ruble fell quite a bit. So Putin felt like there were quite a few consequences and it caused him to slow down though he never fully stopped trying to take the Ukraine at any point. The years of 2014 to 2021 were marked by conflict in the eastern Ukraine region, where various separatist pro-Russian factions 
protested, caused political trouble, and even fought militarily to leave Ukraine in the path of drifting towards the EU. They wanted to join Russia instead. There were skirmishes, there were ceasefires, and there was even some trench warfare between the separatists and the Ukrainian government forces. Thousands of people actually died during this period over the eight years. About 14,000 people died by some estimates. So if you've been li living in eastern Ukraine, it's been no picnic. Now, it's very important to understand that while this conflict in East Ukraine did start originally as some legitimate discontent and protesting with the relatively corrupt Ukrainian government in the western part of the country, this issue did not continue organically on its own past 2014. This conflict was regularly pushed along and given fresh oxygen by the Kremlin, and there were always people who were strangely affiliated with the Russian security apparatus that were involved in it all the time. Uh, weird mustache man Igor Gherkin is the most obvious example of such a figure, but there were many others. In any case, there is ample evidence to demonstrate that for years the Kremlin constantly pushed on this conflict with the ultimate goal being destabilizing eastern Ukraine and at minimum bringing them into the fold. But in terms of a full-blown military invasion, Putin was on a bit of a break. And there were many reasons for this. Uh, it's certainly fair to say that Donald Trump kind of kept him on the back foot because you didn't really want to invade another country with Donald Trump reacting in some totally crazy and unexpected way. And there were other reasons, but basically between the election of the relatively young and inexperienced former comedian uh, Vladimir Zelensky to be the leader of Ukraine in 2019, and the defeat of Donald Trump in 2020, as well as eight years worth of work by Putin's uh, sort of separatist plants in eastern Ukraine, by 2022, he kind of felt like he could make a play for the rest of the country. Now, at this point in the video, it's very important to disarm the various arguments that Russia has put out there in terms of justifications for their invasion that don't jive with the background that I just gave you guys. Uh, it's important to disarm these arguments because I've seen them disseminated and repeated by a lot of my English-speaking friends, and they're all deeply flawed. So I'll tell you the three uh, main arguments, why they're flawed, and then I'll give you what Putin's real motivation is, as far as I can tell. Argument one, Russia has to invade Ukraine because otherwise Ukraine is going to join NATO, and that would be an unacceptable risk to Russia because that would bring NATO right to Russia's border in a way that's just too dangerous, and it just cannot accept it. So the big issue with that argument is that NATO is already on Russia's border. If you look at this map of the NATO uh, members, as you can clearly see, Latvia and Estonia have already done, without any consequence, what Russia claims would be too consequential for the Ukraine to do. So you can simply tell based on that that the argument that uh, Ukraine might join NATO in and of itself is not the real argument for why they would invade it. Argument number two, Russia must invade Ukraine because Ukraine has a strong Nazi presence and must be denazified for the safety of all of its neighbors as well as the safety of itself. This argument is basically nonsense with a grain of truth. Uh, there is, or rather was until recently, a regiment in eastern Ukraine uh, that did have sort of neo-Nazi roots. Uh, their main mission statement was actually fighting separatist forces in eastern Ukraine up until 2022. And uh, that's pretty much the extent of it. That is as far as Nazification 
uh, exists in the Ukraine. Now, it's very important to note that Nazis are not in any way represented in the Ukrainian parliament. They don't have a party, they don't have sitting members or anything of the sort. So it's very silly to suggest that a neighboring country has to invade Ukraine in order to stop the Nazi threat from blossoming. It's also very strange to claim that Ukraine is, you know, turning to Nazism, considering they have a very, very obviously Jewish president in Vladimir Zelensky, who was elected only recently in a completely legitimate vote, and his being Jewish did not stop him from sweeping over 70% of the vote in that election. I would also point out that another place that has a surprisingly robust Nazi presence is Russia itself. And the Nazis in Russia have actually held fairly significant demonstrations over in Moscow in the recent past. So if Putin really wanted to engage in denazification, maybe he should start in his own backyard. You know, that only makes sense. Argument number three. Pro-Russia citizens in eastern Ukraine are being oppressed by the Ukrainian authorities and they have to be liberated by Russia. This argument was formed a bit more recently as Russia has backed off its plan to take over all of Ukraine and has instead been forced to just focus on the East. While certainly there's truth that there's discrimination or even oppression in eastern Ukraine towards pro-Russia citizens, this does not actually require an invasion. If anything, all Russia has to do is welcome with open arms any pro-Russia citizens in eastern Ukraine that feel oppressed and let them move into Russia. Like, if that was their legitimate concern, there's really no need to invade over it. Now, certainly there are oppressed, pro-Russia type of people in eastern Ukraine who are actually quite happy that Russia is stepping into the area. Uh, and the reason they're happy is because that should bring an end to the separatist conflict in the region that I've been mentioning. But obviously, they are sort of excited uh, because of uh, odd reasons, since it is in fact Russia that has spurred the conflict on that has caused them so much grief. So those are the three main false arguments that you might hear out there. But what is the truth? Why is Putin so motivated to take over the Ukraine? Is it a question of their vast natural resources? Does Putin have brain damage? Well, actually, the answer is so straightforward that it's almost kind of silly. Putin simply wants a return to glory of an old Russian empire, sort of a return to the Soviet Union without the communism. And he feels in his heart that Russia can only return to its full glory with Ukraine and Belarus at minimum as parts of it, and that Ukraine should naturally form a part of Russia, and that its separation in the first place, according to Putin, was a bizarre error that just has to be rectified. He has openly stated all of this in the past, so this isn't all theory or anything like that, and it actually makes a certain amount of sense for a person of Putin's age and background to feel this way. Not all Russians feel this way, but if you happen to be 30-something and well-established in the Soviet regime in the late 1980s when the whole thing came crashing down and it left you destitute both personally and financially and in terms of status, it makes sense psychologically that you would like to see some kind of a return to that bygone era. So that psychology all adds up fairly well. So yeah, not all Russians feel this way by far, but Russians, you know, of Putin's age and of a certain background often do. So the reason to invade Ukraine is actually powered by one man's psychology and ambitions. Unfortunately, it happens to be the one man who has singular control of Russia and what the entire Russian government does or doesn't do on any given day. So, with that all out of the way, let's summarize the first 120 days roughly on the war and where it has gone thus far. 
Initially, when Russia invaded, it was hoping that it was going to quickly, swiftly, and easily take over all of Ukraine, and that the war might last weeks or days and have very minimal resistance and casualties, just like Crimea was. This is really the only kind of war that Putin wanted, because invading a country that's a neighbor, that you share so many things with that people have relatives in and have visited uh, if they're Russian and, and all that kind of thing, that's unpopular. People don't want to see that kind of war and they don't want to see a lot of casualties in that kind of war, certainly, which is a big reason why Russia held back on most of its air power in the early days of the invasion. They just didn't want to see uh, you know, Ukrainian cities that Russian citizens were well familiar with being bombarded into the ground. They didn't even want to call it a war. They instead chose to call it a special operation. And so, with Belarus providing some access from the north, uh, basically, Russian forces came in from several directions and proceeded to try and surround the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, to choke off the leadership for the country. It was then that they discovered they'd made a miscalculation. They had calculated that Ukrainian leadership, including the inexperienced Vladimir Zelensky, would simply flee the country. And that would be the end of it. The leadership would topple and the rest of the country would fall. Instead, Zelensky proved very stubborn, as did the former pro-boxer mayor of Kiev, whose photographs you might have seen. The leadership rallied, they took up arms, they made uh, inspiring videos, and they demonstrated that they're willing to stay and fight, and then they articulated the Russian invasion as the encroachment of a non-democratic, autocratic nation onto a democratic nation, and that if Russia were successful in its invasion, Ukrainians would lose their democracy. This argument motivated a lot of Ukrainian citizens to take up arms and happened to be 100% true, since Ukraine actually runs a legitimate democracy where a leader of the country can be defeated, whereas Putin doesn't run a legitimate democracy where he genuinely cannot be defeated. This was combined with a badly organized and understandably demotivated Russian military uh, to leave the invasion pretty much sputtering within a month, and then the Ukrainian forces managed to rally back, they uh, used their built-up strength that they had created since 2014, and they pushed the Russian forces back from around Kiev into the east and southeast areas of the country. And that kind of led us to where we are today. Soon, the war that was only supposed to last a couple weeks had lasted about 110 days, which is getting to be a long time in war terms. And with every single passing day, uh, there was more weapons and money and resources flooding into Ukraine from its various NATO allies. The Kremlin scrambled to reorganize the official, you know, sort of goals of the invasion, to just the taking back of the Donbass region in the east and all the other areas where pro-Russian separatists have been strongest over the past several years. And then the sanctions started to come in really hard and really fast. Initially, Western leaders didn't want to levy too many sanctions because, frankly, they also thought Ukraine would fall quickly and there wasn't much point. But when it became obvious that Ukraine was actually holding its ground, Western leaders sort of got a lot braver, and then sanctions both from nations as well as multinational corporations started gushing pretty hard and pretty fast. To say that the Russian economy has been pretty badly crippled to a state that it hasn't seen since the 90s isn't really exaggerating it. I mean, it's bearable over there for now, but pretty soon they're going to start running out of things that they really need. And I don't mean just like McDonald's burgers and iPhones and Instagram access, but soon they're going to start running out of replacement parts for the various Western and German cars that have become quite commonplace in Russia over the years, but now the original manufacturers won't sell them any parts.
Meanwhile, Russian casualties have really piled up. This is now the bloodiest military operation in the whole European area and the bloodiest military operation that Russia has had since World War II. It's bloodier than their foray into Afghanistan in the 1980s. And just to give you a little bit more context, Russia has already lost more troops to this Ukraine invasion than the U.S. has lost troops uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq over their entire stay in both of those countries. At the same time, faced with a growing backlash regarding this unpopular war back in Russia, a backlash so fierce it has actually resulted in regular sabotage of Russian military vehicles and supplies by Russian citizens, Putin has decided to go with a crackdown on information, a crackdown that's so severe and harsh that basically any protesting, critical reporting about the war, or really any really, um, you know, critical mentioning of the war in any way is no longer allowed in Russia. The crackdown is so extreme that even websites that were memorializing in very patriotic pro-Russian terms the casualties that were happening in the Ukraine have been told to shut down their reporting, just so that Russian citizens don't hear about all the deaths. This crackdown has essentially caused whatever remained of free media uh, and opposition in Russia to either pack up or flee close up, whatever. They're gone. So Russia has, in the past four months, become way, way, way more uh, autocratic in terms of information. Russian authorities have tried everything they could to minimize the consequences of this war and minimize Russian citizens noticing it. Uh, in fact, it's not a coincidence that many of the soldiers being pulled for this invasion are gathered from, you know, sort of more remote, more poor regions of Russia, so that when the body bags come back, it's not really noticed in power centers such as Moscow or St. Petersburg. But with each passing day, the unpopular war that people do not really want is getting worse and more unpopular and casualties are piling up while the victories are clearly not piling up. So I don't know how much longer they can hide all this. In the first few days of the war, there was very reliable information that the plan was to take over all of Ukraine and then annex it in some way and then have Belarus declare that they're also joining in and create a brand new expanded Russian empire. But instead, Putin has bitten off way more than he can chew. And uh, at the moment, it's looking like best case scenario, he is going to take an incredibly expensive uh, loss and tons of casualties in exchange for minor territorial gains. Meanwhile, Vladimir Zelensky is extremely motivated, both personally and as a matter of public opinion, to take Russia and push them right back into their own territory. Most Western leaders think that such an attempt to push Russia back will be incredibly difficult, and they would prefer that Zelensky concede a little bit of territory in exchange for a ceasefire, as well as concede that Crimea is going to stay as a part of Russia. But it remains to be seen which one of those things is going to play out, if any of them. Either way, there is almost no chance that Russia is going to successfully take over all of Ukraine now that all of the anti-air power has arrived on the Ukrainian side. All in all, it's an extremely bad situation that really didn't have to be and didn't have to happen. So there you go, guys. That is my summary of the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict as I see it. Uh, now, if you want to check out somebody who does sort of more ongoing, regular coverage of this, I highly recommend a fellow named Maxime Katz. I'll link to his channel down in the video description. And this is a trilingual fellow who speaks in Russian, but actually adds really, really high quality English captions below his videos that he types up himself because he also speaks good English. And uh, he even keeps it kind of light and humorous despite the serious uh, subject matter that he's discussing. As far as I'm concerned, his coverage work on the conflict is second to none, so check him out. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed my video on the subject, make sure you're subscribed, that you've smashed the like button, 
and we'll see you all next time.